Everyone loves a big payday, but loving a payroll provider, that's a little bit weird. (laughs) Yet all across the country, business owners are loving doing payroll with Gusto. Gusto is easy, simple to use, plus it does all your W-2s, which is huge, so they never have to be late again. That has happened to me once before. And they even have HR support that's a phone call away, which I also know small business owners need times a million. It's modern, easy, typically only takes about 11 minutes to actually run payroll, so it's efficient also. Plus, they're giving you a three-month free trial as soon as you run your first payroll with them. So just go to gusto.com slash EM so you can experience it for yourself. Potent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I'm Jamie Masters. And today on the show, we have Stefan Spencer. You can find him at stephanspencer.com. He is a genius at SEO. I just came on his show. He has a podcast called Get Yourself Optimized, another one called Marketing Speak. And he has had amazing clients. You should check out his testimonial page. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, thanks for having me. Well, and it's funny, when you, when I was on your show, we were both debating because you had worked with uh, Steven Spangler, who had a really big thing online, and the people that I worked with, the Diet Coke and Mentos, Evie Bird guys, were online at the same time, and you totally beat us in online marketing. Just as a side note, I was new. You totally did. I'm so glad you came on the show and we could talk about it. But you are you are sort of heralded as, as an SEO whiz. SEO has changed like crazy, especially from back in the day to now. So do you think back then it was better or do you feel like we still have lots of opportunity now? Oh, we have, I think, more opportunity now than ever before. Good. I'm so glad you say that. Okay. Because why? Yeah. I mean, if you think about uh, where things are heading with AI, machine learning and all that, and how you can just be on top of the cutting edge of stuff, if if you put the time in and, and you've got the interest, it's not so much the gaming that used to work and, and doesn't anymore. It's that you have to outsmart an AI to win. And I, I think the best way to outsmart an AI is with your own AI. So you got to kind of get familiar with artificial intelligence and, and how to utilize these things in order to win the game. But I'm, I'm excited for the future. Okay. So we geeked out on your, on your podcast before. So you are a futurist and love singularity. And so when we talk about AI, I love this stuff. The thing is that I know my audience is a little like, I am just a small business owner, just staying in my lane. I only have minimum time. What, how, how can I actually optimize and use SEO? What would you say are the core things that they can do besides getting their own robot? No. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we did geek out a lot on. Uh, it was really fun. We talked about your sword wall and everything. Um, okay, so the basic fundamentals for SEO that anybody who's going to have a website needs to do is they need to identify the keywords that matter, and those are the words that are relevant to your business. They are popular with searchers, and they're attainable to rank on page one for. Mm. Okay, so that's one piece of it. You got to identify the keywords and those keywords, you're going to create editorial calendars out of those lists. You're going to optimize existing product pages, landing pages, and so forth around those keywords. So there's a lot of uh, utility you're going to get out of that keyword list. So next you're going to look at your content and you're going to look at it from a lens of, is this content remarkable? Is it worthy of remark? So if you're familiar with Seth Godin and The Purple Cow, uh, f- one of my favorite books, it's, it's awesome. And, and uh, Seth is like a marketing hero to me. I actually had him on the show, on Marketing Speak, on, on the other show um, about six months ago. It's a fabulous interview. So definitely check that out. But if you have something that's worthy of remark, then you've got something that is, is spreadable, that's linkable and link worthy and uh, could, can perform well on social media as a nice bonus. Just as an FYI, as an aside, if you have something kind of go viral on social media or do really well on social media, it doesn't mean that you're going to get any SEO benefit out of it. So that's an important distinction because all these social sites like um, YouTube and Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, uh, even Wikipedia, all the social sites, they know follow their external links, meaning... Those links don't count for juice, like for SEO juice, Google juice, 
you know, I'm oversimplifying it. You know, it's authority, it's trust, it's importance. But you need that in terms of links from other sites, and you're not going to get any of it from the social networks. Thank you okay. for saying that because a lot, no offense, but I have, I have clients that have SEO guys and they're like, oh, let's build out the social profile and we're going to do this. And I was like, is that how they're trying to do the SEO? Because I don't know if that's going to work for you. Now, don't get me wrong. You can start to know what goes well on those sites and that's good. But like you said, it doesn't, the backlinks don't actually matter. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not that you should not do social media marketing. It's that you need to um, plan appropriately and uh, think of this as an indirect channel, an indirect means to the end of getting to the top of Google, right? You could get in front of influencers who have uh, powerful blogs as far as Google's concerned because of your uh, social spread in Facebook and so forth. That can work. That can be uh, very effective, but it's an indirect uh, way to get to the top of Google. So, so you got remarkable content, you've got the keywords identified, and now you've got to get out there and network the heck out of your amazing, remarkable stuff, because you can't just build it and they will come. What was the movie? Uh, Field, Field of, of Dreams. Dreams. Yes. <laughs> right. I know. You everybody have to wants outreach. That to yes. Okay, tell me more about this because I feel like everybody figures on-page SEO. Uh, they're like, oh, I did the keyword stuff. I did what I'm supposed to do. And then they they sort of leave it and it just goes into the ether. And they're like, it didn't work for me. So tell me all of the things on trying to actually get. Like yes, yeah. Yeah, so the, the high value links that you're going after are ones where the sites are trusted mm -hmm. by Google. They're important. Uh, they're authorities. They're authoritative. And the way to identify these uh, influential websites and blogs is to use a tool, one that identifies uh, authority and, and, and even trust as individual metrics, like Majestic, for example, or linkresearchtools.com, or um, Ahrefs, although that's, they don't have a trust metric. I love that tool. And uh, their authority metric is uh, DR, domain rating. So there's uh, tools out there. Moz has a domain authority or DA, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you're going to get a sense for which are the more important and trusted and, and authoritative sites and which ones are not worthy or worth your time to chase after. How and do you then, know what level that is, though? What are the? I know each one has its own sort of category, but is there a, a metric that we can go on that would be like, ooh, the, this and above is really good? Yeah. It depends on on the metric, mm -hmm. but let's say it's uh, trust flow and citation flow from majestic.com. Okay. Let's say that it's a single digit number of uh, trust flow and, uh, and or citation flow. That's probably not worth your time to chase after. Okay. Yeah. If it's domain authority mm -hmm. and it's a, let's say it's under 30, uh, maybe if it's really niche specific to your industry, okay, but probably more in the 40s, 50s, and, and up is a domain authority that would be much better. Awesome. So you're yeah. really, really just trying to get the high quality stuff. Okay. Yeah. Because it, it, it's the 80-20 rule, but it's more like 90-10. Or, or more, you know, because well, the, the Pareto principle. Well, so the question, though, then is those bigger sites are harder to get on. So that's what everyone's saying. They're harder to get on. So, yes, they definitely weigh more, but maybe we could get a whole bunch of little sites. So how do you actually uh, trump that? <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the little sites that um, have low authority and trust scores could actually hurt you. Mm. So you got to be very... Um, deliberate, very picky about which sites you target okay. because they might have toxic links pointing to their sites mm. and that toxicity passes on to you. And then you need to use a, a, a detoxing tool like Link Detox to try and find all the toxic links and remove those, do a disavow to uh, submit a disavow file to Google through Search Console, uh, reach out to these spammy websites and insist that they remove the link. It's a real mess. That sounds hellish. Yeah, nobody wants that. Okay. All the people that don't know what SEOs are like, oh my gosh, that's why I didn't get into SEO. I don't want to screw it up. But how do you yeah. get the links from the big guys then? Okay. So here's uh, here are a few different powerful strategies. 
I, I use this very effectively with a client uh, who owns, a, I don't know, a billion dollars or more in real estate. They specialize in Section 8 housing, mm. really nice Section 8 housing. Not the, they're not slumlords. <laughs> and uh, they were rehabbing and doing a grand reopening of a building in downtown Denver. It was going to be beautiful and uh, really high end. And it was Section 8 housing. And they were going to send out a press release. I'm like, no. Journalists hate press releases. It, it makes it makes them feel so not special. It's the, it's the opposite of a scoop, right? And so I uh, found a recent article on the Denver Post uh, website that related to rising rents in downtown Denver. So it was recent and it was spot on as far as the topic. Of course, the journalist uh, was listed there as the author of that article and their email address. So. Um, now we have our in. We're going to comment not on the article itself. It was like a, a Facebook comment or a WordPress comment. No, we're going to send an email. And as uh, in the first version of the email that he sent me, thank goodness I asked him to send me the draft first. It was a mini press release. He took his oh, press no. release and made it like two <laughs> paragraphs. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so I'm like, don't do that. Back to the drawing board. Make it insightful, thought-provoking. And, and you, with your status as the uh, general manager of, of this big company, with an insightful uh, thing to say about his great article, mm. he will probably respond. And sure enough, he did. So the version that he came up with as round two was amazing and uh, sent it off. He got a response within minutes. And uh, the journalist sent a colleague from the paper to cover the grand reopening, a full page article the that week in the Denver Post. Wow. And of course it went online on the on denverpost.com as well. So this stuff can work. It just requires some outside the box thinking. So that's one example of a strategy. You don't need to hire an expensive PR firm. Well, the I, question was so you're really good at this. He had hired you, thank goodness. He was going to screw it up and send out a <laughs> press release, right? And this yeah. is what I feel like uh, business owners do. They're like, I think I heard something like this. But but just to recap, you made the journalist's job easier. Like you gave, yeah. you hand delivered, especially because you're great with copyright, I'm, I'm assuming, hand delivered some marketing that was, that was a hook that all they do is take it and run with it. Yeah. But <gasps> the thing is, I didn't write that piece. I just asked my client to write something insightful or thought provoking from his standpoint as being in that industry. He read the article, he had some thought provoking things to say. I reviewed it and I'm like, this is awesome. I didn't have a hand really? in writing it oh, at good. all. Okay. Yeah. Because other people would be like, well, of course he hired you and you're amazing. So therefore, okay. So he actually wrote the article and within minutes he got it too. That's amazing. Okay. What else yeah, do you so have? He wrote, the, cool. he wrote the commentary about yes. the article. Yes. Perfect. I adore that. Okay. So I, I want more of your tactics and tips, but what came up to me is how do you pick, if we've got a humongous content calendar and a humongous list of keywords, how do we pick which ones we go after for, especially journalists? Because that does take effort to research if there's an article and all fun stuff like that. Yeah. Well, it, I, I would say sort the list of keywords uh, by popularity. Okay, so that's the search volume, uh, monthly search volume typically. Mm -hmm. And then uh, which ones can give you an opportunity to say something worthy of remark that's um, kind of either controversial or a little bit uh, counterintuitive or makes people do a double take if they see that, uh, that keyword in a, in, in a thought-provoking, interesting headline you know, kind of, kind of the cognitive dissonance sort of angle. So you're looking for a hook. And whether that hook allows you to write a great piece for your own blog or to pitch it to a journalist, or what Andy Crestadina calls the evil twin strategy, where you do both with the one piece of content that you've done all the research on, and you just flip the headline, essentially, right? So you're saying, these are the seven best practices to whatever, right? whatever the keyword is. And then the evil twin is the seven, what? Mistakes. Biggest mis yeah. Biggest mistakes, <laughs> right? And it's the same research. You're just kind of rewriting the, the piece of content 
with that new headline. Huh. Okay, so question, because I I actually wrote a, a post about thinking when when um, there was a whole bunch of buzz online for Napoleon Hill and was he a fraud or was he not? I was like, that's a really good hook. And I've interviewed almost 500 millionaires. So I looked up the keywords and I found uh, one specific one. We ended up giving away the PDF for free the int- and we rank like number one, tons and tons of traffic. The problem that I wasn't totally paying attention to is that is not my audience. So like the... <laughs> Holy, it's not my audience. It's a lot of people from India. Uh, they're coming from a bunch of different places. So do you actually try and vet keywords per what you think the avatar would be? Or you just write the article and try and rank it and hope that, like I was paying, I was getting, I think like 50,000 bids or something crazy. And I was like, I'm paying for a lot more server space for this now. That's very interesting. I'm going to let that one go a little low and not worry about it. Right. I, but all I was trying to do is hit the number one. How do you, how do you manage that? Oh, the, what a great insight because when you have something that is not meant for your target audience, it can actually still help you to reach your target audience, mm-hmm. but in an indirect way. Ooh. So that article about think and grow rich, and maybe it's uh, from a contrarian angle, like, no, it's 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 hooey or whatever, right? Um, incidentally, I just had John Shin, who's running the Think and Grow Rich uh, world tour and uh, made the Think and Grow Rich documentary possible as a guest on the Get Yourself That's Optimized amazing. I've pod- talked to them podcast. too about all of this stuff. No, my, mine was a wonderful piece about it. I don't think he's a fraud, but yes, it was hilarious. I was going on the spin, but you're right because I needed a hook. Yeah, yeah. And it's a great hook. So what if it's not going to bring in a single uh, person that's your, your exact avatar? That's totally fine if you're going to reach the linkerati, the influencers that are authoritative and highly trusted and important as far as Google's concerned, because then it's the rising tide that lifts all boats. Every page of your site, every landing page, every sales page, every product page, your home page, they will all rise in the rankings because of that one article. And, and the other thing that I did is I went to the, the affiliate people that did the documentary for Think and Grow Rich and I got, I chatted with them. They wanted to know because I had this highly trafficked uh, page and now I have an affiliate for them on the thing. So, and that was the thing I was like, oh, I got to meet them at least. Cause I was like, I don't know what to do with this. Let's see if we can optimize something. Cause I care about optimizing too. So I appreciate though, that it rises everything instead of me going, well, that was worth all the time and the effort. Right. Okay. So thank you for that. So, so, um, can we, can, I don't know that you can predict this, but can you predict if keywords are going to be good or bad? Is there any way that you can kind of know who would be good for your avatar or not? Or you guess? Uh, yeah. You, as far as which keywords your avatar is actually typing into Google, you could do focus groups. Yeah. You could do online surveys of your audience, uh, of your customer base, of your email list uh, subscribers, you know, things like that. But if uh, you're, you're laser targeting in on certain demographics, psychographics, clickographics, actually the best place to start then isn't with Google, it's with Facebook. So if that you think sense. like, okay, what is, um, uh, what is an ideal avatar or persona uh, in terms of their hobbies, their uh, income brackets, their gender, age group, all that, you can laser target in on Facebook, get those folks on uh, y- your list and then create a, uh, a, a lookalike audience in Facebook and get an even larger audience of those people. And then you offer some sort of quiz or fun uh, game or or survey or contest with some prizes so that now you get the data from them. They're they're your avatar and you got a whole lot of them. So you're going to get statistical significance. And now you understand how they think, what their buying criteria are, uh, what the buyer journey looks like. That makes yep. so much sense. Okay. It's interesting though that, you, so I was thinking that you would test it in sort of PPC, like Google PPC or something like that to try and see if it's actually converting for you instead of wasting, not wasting the time, but taking all the time to try and rank for SEO. You can well, you're going to be wasting keywords. money though. Well, exactly. <laughs> that's even worse. That's what, but that's why I like your Facebook idea. That makes a lot of logical sense, yeah. though it's a long, and you're still spending a lot of money and it's a long process, but you'll get actual data that you can actually vet and use, yeah. which makes sense. I, I, I think of Facebook as um, <clears throat> kind of a 
uh, part of part of the whole ecosystem. And if you're not doing Facebook advertising, you're missing the boat. Like really? if if yeah, if if let's say that you just have a website that's doing well and so forth, and you're neglecting Facebook, that is an asset that you could have built up. I think of assets in terms of like rich dad, poor dad, yes. an asset puts money in your pocket and a liability takes money out of your pocket. So the house that you live in is probably a liability, not an asset. Whereas the house you bought and renting out, that's, that's an asset. Well, there are lots of online assets. There's your email list. There's your retargeting audience mm -hmm. on Facebook and on Google although Google calls it remarketing instead of retargeting, but it's the, it, it's the audience that's been to your website that you, you've uh, pixeled and now you can follow them as they're you know, scrolling around on, on Facebook or as they're surfing uh, the internet, if it's Google, you know, the display network, or in, in retargeting for search, mm -hmm. uh, re remarketing for search is what they call it. Isn't with, it hilarious uh, that you have to change to. the name? Yeah, same thing. I know, it's <laughs> silly. so silly. But, you know, it's like this is uh, uh, an asset that, that you can nurture and you're uh, neglecting that asset by just not doing anything with it. If, if you're not even collecting that data, if you're not building a retargeting audience, even if you're just spending a little bit of money that's just a waste when somebody goes to buy your site and they're like, okay, how big's your email list? Uh, what's your, uh, retargeting audience look like? And you're like, what, what? Like, oh yeah, <laughs> we haven't been doing much as far as email. We didn't really ask for email addresses. Uh, but we've got some sales and like, or we got some, you know, affiliate revenue. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah, you've got a piece of the equation, but you've missed a whole bunch of the other things. So how do you, cause I'll loop it back around to the other tactics. So I still want some of those, but how do you deal with, cause this is what all the people say, especially when they're not doing Facebook marketing, they're like, Facebook is dying and the costs are going up like crazy and you have to pay just to have boost anything. So anybody sees you at all or emails, the other one, open rates are going down, blah, everybody is chicken little. What do you say to all that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, just, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Tough it up. <laughs> like, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes. Suck it up. Yes. So if you think about what Facebook needs to do in order for them to succeed, they need to keep people on the platform. They need to keep them happy and, and engaged. So if your ad is trying drawing people off of the platform to a landing page and it's an opt-in, it's some sort of uh, lead gen form or something, that's not a great experience. That doesn't make for happy Facebook users. Whereas if you keep them on the platform and they're watching the videos natively on the platform that you've uploaded and that you're spending money advertising to, to expand your reach, that's great. And then you can do a retargeting uh, ad as a follow-up to people who watch, let's say, 75% of the video or, or more. You can uh, upload your customer list and create a custom audience from that and target those people. You can create a lookalike of your your customers yeah. with uh, uh, that based on on that custom uh, audience of the of the customer list or your email subscribers. There's so much opportunity. The key here is you got to make sure these people are happy. And one of the keys to that is the um, the share to reaction ratio. If your stuff is so darn good, your ads don't even really look like ads. You look real and human and like you're part of the ecosystem. It's not all professionally shot. You didn't do all your makeup and everything. It, you look human, right? Yep. And you're sharing a valuable message or you're saying something that's worthy of remark, you know, an idea worth spreading sort of thing. Then you'll get a lot of shares, and if that's if that's at least as high as the amount of reactions, the likes, the wows, the loves, and 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 so forth, you're winning. You you've got something that that Facebook wants you to get a lot of reach out of. So because they like uh, it a too. little bit. Of, yeah, they've got lots of self-interest, which makes sense. They're in business also. It's funny because yeah. Stu McLaren posted uh, one of his ads and he's like in a pool making a crazy face. And I follow him anyway. And I just thought it was a regular thing of him. And you're right. It feels like people, especially advertisers, are getting better and better at making it look native. But 
to me, it's only not a liability if you have a funnel that converts. Like if the people that <laughs> that are on Facebook don't have a funnel that actually converts, then it is a liability. And I feel like that's where people go like this. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And so, and because they've done it for so long or it's, or they've tried it and it didn't work for them. Wh what do you say to them to try and test it again? Because it, it's an asset, like you said. Yeah. Well, it's, it, the, the funnel that converts isn't the only way that they can turn that into a positive ROI. Let's say that you are targeting, let's, let's say journalists. Mm -hmm. no, no, let's say even, um, the editors or editorial managers Ooh. of big magazines and trade journals in your industry, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's no funnel you're going to send them through, but you want to reach them. You want them to get to know your brand and your personality and see the depth of your subject matter expertise. Mm -hmm. So that might seem like a waste of money from the outside looking in, but it's not That's because so good. Yeah. What, what if you contact them in three months after they keep seeing all your brilliant stuff, right? that you, your thought leadership pieces yep. that you're pushing out to a laser targeted audience? So maybe it's 300 people and you're spending, uh, I don't know, 400 bucks a month on that. Like, that is totally a very worth wise it. Investment. Totally <laughs> okay. worth it. So, so in that case, though, having somebody that is a Facebook ad manager on your team would be really helpful, also, right? Or have, do you feel like it's easier to train somebody on your team to be up to speed on marketing tactics, or hire agencies, or what? What do you think is sort of the best way? Because agencies are expensive, and that's why it's sometimes hit or miss. Uh, my preferred model is working with a an individual consultant hmm. because. If it's a jack of all trades sort of agency, oh yes, we do SEO, we do Google ads, we do Facebook ads, we do copywriting, conversion optimization, uh, analytics, uh, social media. Like, okay, is there anything you don't do? And and, yeah, and of course, you're awesome, like grade A, top shelf on every single yeah, one of 80, these things. Yeah, eighty twenty rule. Totally, you're great at all of them. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally, don't buy that. So if you work with a, a consultant who gets the internet and mm. and the marketing kind of uh, mix like you know like i do for example well, that's what i was gonna you say you either have to here. tell me you or somebody you have to refer us so we'll put links and stuff like that too because it's hard to find somebody no offense it's hard to find somebody good that especially if the person that's hiring them doesn't understand seo or facebook or whatever i just have had so many clients who are like well i just signed up with this guy and then he just he's not it's okay no right and it's yeah. hard to vet if you don't actually know so any besides you and that too give us links so that way we can uh, put them in the show <laughs> notes for everybody okay yeah so and one one of the things i do for my clients is i help them vet people if they're looking to hire an in-house SEO or an in-house marketing manager or or social media manager I will grill that person in a nice way as a second interview and make sure that they are not blowing smoke. I'm laughing because that's what I do too. I love that part. <laughs> yeah. In yeah. fact, I have an SEO BS detector worksheet that has all these trick questions that you can have uh, available in the interview process. You just pick some questions from that, slip those questions so into good. the interview process, and there's only one right answer to each. So then you know if you got snookered or not. Like there's a question in there. Tell me your process for optimizing meta keywords. That is a trick question because meta keywords never counted in Google ever, not even on day one. Oh my gosh. So I if love they this. say I anything that other list. than I yeah, still want that list. I literally have a call like in two days with an SEO guy that's working with one of my clients. So Thank you. I want that list. That's killer. Uh, but yeah. that's but well. That's I'll tell you stuff. what. I'll put I'll put that on a uh, special page just for your listeners. It's going to be at marketingspeak.com/slash/millionaire. <laughs> Perfect. So to bring it back, the tactics that I, that you said about the journalists, I love. Do you have any other tactics like that to help build up those big site links? Oh yeah, so many. Uh, so so let's say that you wanted to become a contributor. Uh, ideally a columnist somewhere big. Like I just got published for the first time on HBR, Harvard Business Ooh, Review. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, uh, that was huge. And of course I got a link with it. So I, I published the article, or they published my article, which was all about uh, travel hacks for business travelers. And then in the byline portion uh, that gives my little bio, it links back to my site. 
So that's a really high value link from a very high trust website that's hard to break into. It's not likely you're going to uh, have any spammy links coming from that site. Definitely not. So, How did you so get that? Th- Are you allowed to tell me? No, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of work and a lot of back and forth and it took about four months, uh, maybe five. But yeah, I, I pulled some strings. I leveraged some friendships, connections that I have. See, it's all networking though, like you said before. But yeah. which site did you link to? Because you have more than one site. Yeah, I linked to stuffandspencer.com. Okay. So, and that's yeah. the other piece that uh, when my, my one of my clients was just mentioned in all sorts of places, Yahoo and NBC and all these things, right? She, she got mentioned. Um, but I was like, oh, but did we ask for a link? And she has two sites. One's local for her local offices and one's not. And we mentioned the local offices. And I was like, so that's, at least Not we ideal. got them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Darn it. I should have said something beforehand. But but how do you pick? Do you have one site that you're really building up the SEO for? Is that how you decide? Yes. Okay. Uh, in, in fact, this is, is a, a bigger question really around do I consolidate all of my remarkable content under one brand, one domain, or do I spread it out across multiple ones? Now, in some cases, I consolidated around one site. In other cases, I set up a separate domain and separate brand. Like in the case of my podcasts, marketingspeak.com is the website uh, for Marketing Speak, the podcast, and then Get Yourself Optimized has getyourselfoptimized.com. Why did I not just do stephanspencer.com slash podcast slash marketing speak? It's because it looks clunky. It doesn't look as uh, legit and as big of a brand. Like th- there are books that are New York Times bestsellers that have been on huge talk shows and so forth. The the authors talking about their books. You would imagine that a book that's a big deal, like uh, I don't know Rachel Hollis's book, w- should have a, a a a website dedicated just to the book, right? And if it doesn't, you, it makes you question how big of a deal that thing really is mm-hmm. that book or that podcast or that um, that show you know if you have a YouTube channel and you don't have a microsite dedicated to that YouTube channel and that YouTube show like for example what Blendtech did with the will it blend <laughs> videos I remember them yeah <laughs> well they're still around I, I I just spoke to their customers I have a blend tech day. yes no I, I love Blendtec it too. I love it <laughs> and the will it blend videos put them on the map. They were already a very successful, you know, I, I'm, I'm guessing eight figure business uh, by the time they came up with this campaign. Mm-hmm. But the idea was let's jam two by fours into the blenders, golf clubs, rake handles. Let's put uh, the iPhone light bulbs one in made there. Me hurt. I was like, Oh, don't put an iPhone. Oh, Not an iPhone. Really I know yeah. that's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an <laughs> Apple fan. But, uh, so this was, really made for really good TV, right? Really very, very uh, clever idea. And if you're a journalist and you're writing about the latest uh, Will It Blend video, do you really want to link to the YouTube channel? Or so would what, it be better would you to go redirect? to... So, if you, so that's the question though, right? So for the podcast, you wouldn't actually have the domain so you could say, go to whatever it is, willblend.com or whatever the thing is, and then have it redirect to their actual site. I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter either way, but then you have everything on the one site so you can technically point things. Or does it not matter? Well, I think it matters. And I think it's it's a positioning play. Hmm. If somebody sees that you redirected them from marketingspeak.com to stephanspencer.com slash podcast mm-hmm. slash marketing speak slash index, whatever. <laughs> then they're like... Dot PHP? No. Okay. <laughs> All right, what just happened here? Yeah, okay. They're going to copy and paste that URL, and that's going to be the link. And now when somebody mouses over in that article that talks about the 10 best podcasts on marketing, and there's marketing speak, and then they look at the link, and it's like a mile long, like, oh, what's that? Is that so legit that they don't? You're like why 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 don't they have just marketingspeak.com? Well, if they if you own it, but then you redirect that URL, then at least they type it in or they feel it. I get it. So that we're talking yeah. nuances here. I totally get it. But I love this stuff, uh, especially because I've been talking a lot more about doing my own personal brand because everyone knows me as me and Eventual Millionaire is the show. But I built up SEO on Eventual Millionaire. And I'm like, well, I can't lose that. And I had a coach that told me to just 
SEO and and switch it over. And I I have heard horror stories from yeah. doing that. So you don't recommend it either, right? No, I okay. recommend building up both brands. And uh, like the the Jamie Tardy brand is a brand you're going to take to the grave. Well, actually, that Jamie is... Masters is because Tardy was my married name. But yes, the one that I have now is the one I'm going to take to the grave. <laughs> okay, scratch that. So the Jamie <laughs> Masters. Yes. Uh, there you I go. just saw your name on the like, oh, something. Oh, it's, it's my old with one. Old, yeah. With the old you are. Well, with the qu old name. question then. So because you're a geek and I like this. So but I don't own Jamie Masters spelled wrong. So Jamie is spelled weirdly and I can't buy. I've been trying to buy it from this lady forever. And she doesn't respond, so everybody should email her and tell her to sell it to me, just as a side note. But what would actually, you do? I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. I would have a domainer contact uh, her, and because they know how to persuade people, and they buy domains all the time, and they sell domains and everything. So you get a domainer or a domain broker, okay, to to contact this person uh, on your behalf so many times i've tried the nice anyway we'll talk about this i will i will look for a domain broker and just let them try and ride with it because i because yeah. the one reason why i haven't switched over to that is because i know everybody even my first grade teacher sp spelled my name wrong and told me i was lying when i was a kid so it's kind of a big deal everybody's spelling urls right <laughs> you are lying wow that's extreme right You'll... first grader lying is great <laughs> but i have issues with my name as you can tell so i really appreciate your info so i'll probably wait and then build up that other brand so give me some more tactics and tips for getting more of these links yeah so you got to think outside the box in terms of campaigns that are worthy of being spread uh, and these could take the form of uh, personality tests and quizzes, infographics, viral videos, worksheets or workbooks, checklists, planners, guides, how to's, uh, anything that's really going to add a lot of value and differentiate uh, yourself and your content from everything else that's out there. Uh, you can do contests as well, competitions. It could be video competitions or image competitions, uh, even scavenger hunts, lots of different ways that you could uh, What would a uh, video, comp this. like a competition, I've, I've talked to a lot of people, we've done a lot of challenges, which brings a lot of backlinks specifically to certain things for the challenge side, but what, what would be like a video competition or what, what type of competition can you walk me through what that would look like for, for getting links? Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, Intuit uh, has their TurboTax division and they did a, a contest, a competition called the Tax Wrap Contest. And you oh, had so it doesn't to have to be cool. It video. could be very uncool. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it's cognitive dissonance. Like who, who's ever heard the words taxes and rap in the oh, same sentence unless videos. it's like a, a rapper who got into trouble for tax evasion, right? Uh, so if you capitalize on that cognitive dissonance and you you require that people make a, a music video that is a rap music video and they have to rap about doing their taxes and ideally using the TurboTax software to do it, you're going to get some pretty remarkable entries. They might be remarkably bad or they might be remarkably good. And the ones that were remarkably good were so good that uh, you know they pr put a, a prize uh, purse out there of I think 25 grand was the grand prize, which is substantial. And the winning entry was really, really good. It was a great music video, well done, uh, nice post-production. Uh, it was, it was great. And, but the, even the second and third prize, uh, entries really, really good as well. And, and what made this different, like the, that made it stand out as being remarkable, even more than the cognitive dissonance of taxes and, and rap music was this they got a spokesperson a spokesman and who do you think they got as their spokesman that would make this really really remarkable some great rapper or bad rapper what do they know <laughs> yeah so kind of counterintuitively or you know again uh writing on this cognitive dissonance sort of uh surprise thing a bad rapper would be better than a good one so who do you think they got as their they're a spokesman. I have no idea. Think back to, you know, years and years ago, the early days of rap. Okay, I was like nine, so <laughs> I don't know. I'm I used, sure to, you listen, heard it I used to listen to Dr. Dre. Like he's okay. cool, but he's not yeah, bad. He's cool. Bad. He was cool. Um, Ice T. No, I don't know. I guess he was cool. No, he wasn't bad. He was cool. <laughs> 
on. You have to tell me. I'm bad at this game. So, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the word ice is in his name. Ice Cube? No. Nope. I don't know. Who is it? He's a white guy. Oh, Vanilla Ice. Vanilla Ice. Yes. I love Vanilla Ice. But he, I thought <laughs> ice, he was good. I thought he was okay, good. Besides well, we, stealing we're all from... entitled to our opinion. <laughs> I love that. Don't even. That's why it wasn't up here. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so he's he's pretty uh, well known. You know, he's got lots of name recognition, so but funny. nobody takes him seriously, especially not these days. Yes. No so kidding. he's very available. He's a real estate guy or something like that now, right? Yeah. He's got a <laughs> DIY uh, show on, on the DIY network. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So he was very inexpensive to buy a couple hours of his time. The, the wow. video team from, from Intuit flew down to his home in Florida and they shot videos of him introducing the contest and introducing the winner, even though they didn't know who it was going to be. Da 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 da. They leave, and uh, yeah, for a very small amount of money, <laughs> they had Vanilla Ice as the the name to really make this contest, this video competition, pop. Good, and I'm going to hire really, Vanilla, really well. Vanilla Ice. Yeah. Now, what's so funny that you say that? So the the Diet Coke and Metro Sky's EP Bird. The reason why they made their initial video was a Coca Cola contest, and that's the only reason why they even did the entire thing, and it was viral. But it was because they only made it for the contest. So go them. So so question though, how do you get backlinks on that? Are you just looking for high quality videos that you know will get shared a lot, and then that's what gets the backlinks? Yeah, so in the case of Intuit, they created a separate microsite dedicated just to the tax wrap contest. <laughs> and I think they put it as a subdomain. Uh, so tax wrap on Intuit dot com or something. That makes like that. sense. Okay. The, the 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 silly thing they did was after, I don't know, a couple years, they took the site down and it's not redirected anywhere. It's just basically a a broken image and a copyright of like two thousand and whatever. <laughs> So they really blew it after building all these great links inadvertently by having a very successful, remarkable contest that people were like, oh my God, you got to check out these these entries. And, and so instead of linking to the YouTube channel or linking to individual videos, I mean, it's still good to embed individual videos, mm. but you know, it's, there's only so many. Like what if there are you know, 200 videos that were submitted and you, you don't want to embed 200 videos into your blog post, maybe the winner and uh, the one you thought was the, the one that should have won. And then here's a link to watch all the other videos. And it happens to be on the microsite, not on the YouTube channel, because the YouTube channel's got all the kind of distraction devices in there. Like, oh, shiny object over here squirrel over there right and yeah. you're like suddenly watching i don't know uh music videos from katie perry and uh uh reality show spoofs and in you know three hours just kind of you you're you're in the twilight zone you're like what where, where'd <laughs> i go text that is youtube i know it's like wait where oh no where am i my children to get in that way too often so the goal though with that is to create such a viral campaign by using sort of everybody sort of a wide array of audiences so that you can potentially get it distributed and picked up everywhere and get all the backlinks. That makes yeah. sense. Okay. And, awesome. and you need to proactively go out uh, with outreach to the folks who would care about this contest or about this, whatever it is, uh, infographic, viral video. How uh, do you find those whatever. people that care about this stuff and what do you write to them? Well, there's this really great search engine. It's called Google. <laughs> Wait, how do you spell that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, I'm being cheeky, but the, the a, a better answer would be use a third party tool that's designed uh, to do the outreach. So it's not just going to find you these influencers, the influencers who matter as far as Google is concerned with the high authority and high trust, mm -hmm. but also that will do the outreach for you. You load in templates and then it does the mail merge with the uh, information in the database on, on these people. And, and it maybe even holds those messages in, in a moderation queue before they get sent out. Like, so you can add an additional sentence. Like, yeah, Oh my what God, are this is somebody I know. Yeah. Uh, I, I know this blogger. So I'm going to say something in the PS or whatever. Like, yeah having a moderation queue that you can look at and and then hit send to all these emails and then it comes into like an SEO inbox instead of clogging up your regular email inbox and what software is that tell me all the things pitchbox 
pitch, pitch box. box. I didn't even yeah. know that. Okay, because we use like Mailshake, um, but but for cold email outreach and it doesn't integrate. So you're saying you can actually find the influencers and email them all in pitch box. Yes, oh. and it tracks the workflow and gives you pipeline reports instead of like Salesforce.com gives you sales pipeline yeah. reports, but this is an outreach pipeline report. Isn't that That's cool? Smart. Yeah. So okay, pitchbox.com. Awesome. Yeah. Give me one more. I know we have to start wrapping up because we are going over, but I really like your tip. So give me one more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, uh, let's go back to this idea of getting um, like a column or a contributorship. Um, like you might wonder how the heck do I get that? You know, it's fine for Stefan to get. Uh, Took know, him four months. And HBR, or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. I'm not him. So, Yes. So you start small, start with sites like business to community or um, your tango or whatever the, your niche covers. And as you build your way up, you're building your reputation. You can apply this uh, strategy, not just to print or to digital uh, magazines, but also to TV or radio. I was just interviewed on a radio station in, in, uh, it, um, Ireland just uh, three hours ago. So that, that's going to air in a week. It's pretty cool. Um, they reached out to me from one of my websites. Mm. So if, if let's say you start small, you go for a business to community.com, it's not that difficult to get into. And let's say you're in the productivity space. And so then you parlay that to getting uh, a columnist uh, gig for lifehack.org. Or lifehacker.com, right? Lifehacker.com is harder than lifehack.org, I remember, because I got it at lifehack.org and I kept thinking it was lifehacker.com. I was like, no, I thought it was the other one. This is back in I know. the day. Do I you, know. I, you got, I got in for a lifehack.org too. It was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we still got backlinks. We're still happy. We still like you too. It was just not as much domain authority <laughs> as the other one, yeah. for sure. But it was pretty good. If you looked at the yes. metrics, it was pretty darn good for a dot org that I'd never heard of before that kind of. <laughs> well, do you spin your article? That's the other piece then too. Can you take the content that you have instead of writing? Cause that's the other thing I'll tell clients about. I've had tons and tons of journalists contact me, which is amazing because I've built up relationships, but writing new content for all these things was a pain. And so when I tell my clients, I'm like, we can just take it and spin it. But SEO wise, where are that's we at really, now? Uh, that's black hat. Black hat not, territory. I don't mean like spin it, spin it. I mean like re- like article rewrite. spinners. No, no, no. Oh no, I would okay, use good. Those. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, where they replace the word? Sorry, I use the yeah. The like oh, synonym goes here. And synonym I know that was no, 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 don't do that. Those would come out, and you'd be reading it. And you'd be like, oh, you don't speak English very well. That's awesome. <laughs> no, yeah. so not those. I mean, I mean rewrite, but similar style of content. Like Does paraphrase it. Yeah, yeah, like have your ghostwriter just make a couple articles that look very similar, but not. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of that because okay. it's pretty obvious that that's been done. Mm-hmm. And then the if if the editorial uh, director who has this, the the policy that you can't republish the same content, and they see that oh, there's a paraphrased version on your blog or some competitor site, mm-hmm. they're not going to be happy with you. They might kick you off uh, the contributorship. So. Uh, Again, back to the beginning of our discussion, Mm -hmm. I mentioned the evil twin strategy. So instead of the seven best practices, now it's the seven biggest mistakes. That's not the same thing, though. I feel like that's the same thing by just tweaking it. But but no, it's a it's a different article. Okay, the headline the headline is different, and thus the hook is different, and thus the article is different. It's still all the same research. These are so nuances. That's what I okay. That's that's interesting. Okay. Right. So, so let's say, let's yeah. take something that um, you've re- recently written about as an example. Give me, give me a topic. Give me a, a headline. Sales work. Oh, I don't even remember. I don't even write the headline. Somebody else does. Uh, sales workflow. But give me stuff. a topic. Yeah. Sales workflow. Sales S- workflow. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, uh, sales workflows that work uh, might be the headline. I okay. just made that up. Um, so, these are the biggest, and then the evil twin would be. Sales disasters that happen because of bad workflows. Okay, and it's the so to so, to so it's you, not the same exact hook. kind. It, yeah. it, well, it's a different hook, and you're going to bring in different stories from your research because these are the okay. bad examples that okay. you didn't use. You used the best practices. Yeah. Now you're using the worst practices, and you're kind of deconstructing what those are. You're still okay. giving the best practice tips in there, but you're okay. saying this is another screw up here. Do you see what they did wrong here? 
See, when I used to write, so we have ghostwriters now, but when I used to do it, I, ha I hated writing. So I would have templatized things, but it would be like this. What is the, what is the main keyword and hook? Right. Yeah. And then I would go millionaire one says this about that topic. Millionaire two says this about, but it was all different. All I could yeah. do is just go beep. Here's another little thing. Oh, there's another little thing. And it, every single one was different, but at least I had a little format that made it easier for me to write all of them. Right. But yeah. would that, if I spun it and made it different, would that be good enough for your, your, for you <laughs> and your ex level of excellence? I think it matters only to the editor who it makes the decision whether you played by the rules or you tried to uh, skate around them. It's still yeah. writing an article. Okay, I get it. Because there's uh, yeah. a lot of people that'll just make crappy, crappy articles and that's not what they're looking for as long as it's well written and it's not just swiped from somewhere else and you did a really good job, then that makes sense. Yeah. But, but let's say own. that you, if you get a, a gig writing for, uh, or column writing for HBR, you're going to submit your very best stuff there and you're not going to hold back. And you're, yeah. you're not going to try and just paraphrase that HBR article and post that to your blog. You don't want to take the chance that the no. editor yeah, is going to see that. They're going to like, and, and remember, you're starting at the bottom and you're working your way up with the smaller uh, media outlets that say mm -hmm. yes to you as being a contributor or columnist. And then you work your way up. And, and uh, again, back to this idea that you're working your way up, but in other media like TV, mm -hmm. you start with small TV stations, yep. local markets, really small local markets, Albuquerque, for example, or Tucson, or Reno. They're a lot easier to get on, and you can make mistakes, and some even pre-record, so you could mess up, and they're like, oh, can we do another take, right? And then you, you earn your chops, because you're not going to end up first time out of the gate uh, as a newbie on TV doing Good Morning America. That would be a disaster for everybody. So you got to work your way up and, and uh, you can cold call TV producers, you know, pitch them at four in the morning. They're up and nobody else is calling them. <laughs> See, this is great. You, I love how you intertwine the old school and the online new school, right? Because it, it does make a difference. That stuff still works. And it's even more rare now than all the people that are just trying to go uh, the conventional route, which I really appreciate. Yep. But what And if guess what happens with these TV appearances? They end up where? Online. Oh, everywhere, right? And then they'll distribute them to other networks. I had no idea that it was with so links. interconnected. Yes. I was on Yahoo and then I was like, oh, I'm on Business Insider's homepage. Oh, I'm on this. I'm, on, I'm like... It just went crazy because it was part of the network. And I had no idea at the time. I was like, shoot, I should have prepared better. Uh, but if you did it on purpose, it makes a lot more sense. Now, for the people that hate writing, I know we have to wrap up, but for the people that hate writing, do you still suggest they write or should they find a go? I hate writing. I'll do TV shows all day long, but I have ghostwriters. For the people that don't have ghostwriters, what do you suggest? Should they just go down the TV route instead or, or really try and get the backlinks to the articles because it's easy, easy easier? Ish. Yeah, it is easier ish. Um, but um, here's what I do. And I think it works well because I've identified myself as a speaker who writes, not a writer who speaks. And I got that distinction from Bob Allen, who wrote a whole bunch of fabulous books like Cash in a Flash and uh, The One Minute Millionaire and so forth. So he says, either you're a writer who speaks or you're a speaker who writes, figure out which one you are, and then focus on that. And then the the other piece that you're not as good at, that's not as much of a natural uh, state for you, you, you convert the stuff that, let's say you're a speaker who writes, the stuff that you spoke, you get, get that converted into writing. So you have a ghost writer, you'll have an editor, you'll have a transcriptionist, you'll have all these people who will kind of follow along and take that stuff, that, that raw material, that you're speaking either from interviews or, or, or TV appearances or um, you know, you're on stage at a conference speaking or in a panel somewhere. Take all that content or even you're just uh, getting interviewed by your, your executive assistant, right? And then they're turning that into uh, a draft of the article. I hate looking at a blank screen or a blank sheet of paper and like, okay, what am I supposed to s start writing? I hate that. If we can just have uh, a draft in front of me, I can um, you know, do something with that. Now I've gotten to the point where my team gets my voice, they get my, my vision and my values, 
I don't even review the stuff that gets posted. They ghostwrite articles for my blog on stephanspencer.com. Every week, a new post makes its way to, to the blog. I never even see them. I don't even know what I've been blogging about for the last six months. I have no idea what I'm tweeting on my Twitter. I'm tweeting apparently seven or eight times a day. My team is handling that. I have 158,000 followers, 1.2 million reach impressions uh, and reach on Twitter. I have no idea what I'm saying there, but I know it's awesome. Uh, and I'm also doing a newsletter every week, which is amazing. I'm so proud of this newsletter. It's the Thursday three. Uh, so something that I found challenging, something I found exhilarating or inspiring and, and something I found uh, interesting or surprising, right? Um, so I put this out every week. Well, I don't, I don't even write it. I have no idea what I've even published on uh, the last X number of weeks or months of the Thursday three newsletter, but it is amazing. And I get positive comments everywhere I go, networking functions, conferences. Hey, I just loved your last week's Thursday three. It was awesome. I'm like, thank you. And, and I hope they don't ask me for details. <laughs> right. Well, when you asked me the blog post name, I'm like, I don't even have a clue what we just posted. Okay. But that, but that's, I so appreciate you saying that because I'm not like that either. And I know a lot of people, they use that as the stopping ground, but, but know that you can do this way easier. Thank goodness we have the technology that we have now and have voice recorders and we can have content everywhere, even if you suck at grammar like I do. I know we have to start wrapping up this way, way longer than I, uh, than I thought because you're awesome. What's one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? Yeah. So I, I would recommend identifying things that are going to make them stand out in a crowded market. Like how can they be remarkable? Mm -hmm. Maybe they start by reading the book, The Purple Cow, or uh, the new book from Seth uh, Godin, which is This is Marketing. Uh, so that would be a good way to to think in terms of uh, remarkable content. Or they could start with my book, uh, The Art of SEO, in Chapter 7. That's all about content marketing. And in fact, I'll include that in the uh, that special page of gifts for your your listeners and, and, and viewers. So marketingspeak.com slash millionaire. I'll include Chapter 7 of The Art of SEO. And this is a big book, so I don't expect your listeners to read all of it. I'm going to look at this thing. It is a thousand... <laughs> pages That's almost insane. they're going to give it to their team be like here this is going to be fun <laughs> wow this is daunting you might get people quitting on you and if you're you not a writer them. and you wrote a book that's like a thousand pages i love that <laughs> uh, well i had co-authors and i had ghost writers that helped me and i had a whole raft of of you know, many many dozens of articles already written for search engine land that we were able to use as as raw material i had stuff that i'd written as guides and white papers over the years and everything. So all that raw material went into the book too. Yeah. But that's not my only book. That's just one. I've got three <laughs> and working on a fourth. Are you really? We'll have to have you back on the show when you have the next book come out. I so appreciate this. Where do they find your podcast? Even though I think we talked about the microsites, but save them again. And where can we find more about you online too? Yeah. So getyourselfoptimized.com, which is all about biohacking, life hacking, productivity, personal development. Uh, that's, a, that's a passion of mine. And so that's getyourselfoptimized.com. My marketing podcast is marketingspeak.com. And not only Seth Godin has been on that, but also Dan Kennedy, Jay Abraham, some of the big marketing legends, some of my, my heroes and, and just all sorts of subject matter experts and everything from YouTube to uh, Facebook and SEO and, and paid search and all that. And then my main site is stephanspencer.com. You can find uh, a whole raft of, of uh, helpful guides and materials on SEO and online marketing there as well. I've got a whole learning center and, um, uh, yeah, and you can follow me on Twitter. I, I've got apparently good things to say there. I'll, I'll add lots of value. I have no idea what it is, but it's S. Spencer is the username. And uh, I, I, I hope you uh, follow me and, and say hi. <laughs> And be like, my do you team. know that I do you know that you just tweeted this? DM him and be like, oh, is this you? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I love I loved your site, especially because you had a list of business problems that you could click on and then you got the answers for each one of them. I thought that was really helpful and eye-opening. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. This was a lot of fun.
Would you consider yourself a high level entrepreneur? Now, most likely if you're listening to this, you definitely are. And what I've heard over and over and over again is it's hard to find like-minded people that are like that too. Again, I'm from Maine, so I totally understand how difficult it can be. Thank goodness I have an amazing online community, so I know tons of them. And that is exactly why we are starting this brand new mastermind group with high-level like-minded entrepreneurs, the ones that you know you can go alongside with that will help move you to the next level, let alone with kick butt coaching from me because I like to slap you around both on focus and on strategy. So if you're looking to double or triple this year, which I know most of you are, I want you to go ahead and apply and see if it's a good fit for you. I will totally tell you if it's not and if I wouldn't do it if I were you, uh, but go to eventualmillionaire.com slash apply. We are looking for amazing like-minded entrepreneurs. My previous mastermind members have told me it is life changing. So take the time today, fill out the very quick application and we'll see if it's a fit. Take care.